There, I unmuted you. How are you tonight? Hello? Hi. You're on. Hello, are you there? I am. Hello, David, can you hear me? I can. Can yeah. you hear me? Good. Yes. Your computer seems to be working well today. was just knocked off. I'm trying to get back on. Oh, okay. Something's wrong. I'm not connecting. Well, we can hear you and see you clearly. You can see me? Oh, I can't. Oh, wait a minute. I... I can't see anything. Is there a chance that your monitor is turned off? Probably not. No, no. <coughs> I was on before, but I just it disappeared. I turned up the volume and it disappeared. Hmm. Try these things. So that was a joint hmm. with video. Can I offer some advice? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can't hear you. Right here. We're in a meeting. It's possible that you minimized the Zoom window and you need to make it big again. happened there. We have a password, it wants a password. Hello, David? Yes. It's, I'm trying to sign in and it's asking for a password. Oh, uh, something. What's something, the password? Uh, there shouldn't, you shouldn't need one. Are you using? Oh. Are you using the Zoom app or are you using Google? Which one have bicycles? This uh, one? Top says Zoom, join a meeting. What else okay, has so it? Sorry. Can you move it out? Uh, meeting ID of personal link name. So meeting ID of personal link name. Can I fill that in? Okay, the meeting ID. But you are already what, on the meeting. What's the meeting ID? 872-902. It says, it says what, what, what is that again? 
uh, it's it's a, a nine zero two. It's yes. eight seven two nine zero oh, two. Eight eight zero. Seven three. But we can see stop doing it after eight eight. Hmm. You you are on and we can see and hear you, so you shouldn't have to add enter that information. It's asking me again to sign in. You say you see me? Yes. David? I see you and I hear you. You see me. I don't see anybody. Well, I don't know what to do. I'm here. What, what are you seeing on your screen? Ah, ah, okay. I see you in the top left, me in the top right. Bill, Nada, uh, Elkan, Robin, Esther, Sally. Esther's frozen. Esther has her picture up. Esther's frozen. Oh. Picture up. Instead of her video. Lady from Davis Synagogue. Mm -hmm. I like the way I get my own name. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody. Oh boy, I just don't know. You are, Rabbi. What's that? I can see you and hear you. Yeah, and now something just appeared on the screen and it's covering up everybody. Oh, well, am I trying to get rid of it? Okay. Um, so uh, it won't go. It's Do you sign and thing? Sometimes. No. I can't get rid of this big thing. I can just barely see David on the left hand side and Nada and Arlene and that's it. What what are what is it that's blocking your view? Ah, ah, ah. Good. Thanks. If you want to leave this meeting, he keeps asking me if I want to leave the meeting. No. Okay. Now I see everybody. Sounds to me like you had a reduced screen. Whatever I had, it seems to be okay now. Good. Okay. Great. You can, you can all hear me? Yes. All right, should we start or wait for a couple of minutes? We can. What's that? We, we have 16 people and um, we may want to, well, wait just one more minute and then we can start. Okay. Is there anything that you want to show today or will you just be talking? Just talking, my favorite thing. <laughs> okay, sounds great.
can I ask before we begin, how many of you have copies of the book? I do. I don't see any reaction. So I do. We do. I do. I do, yeah. Two I, have, I have the electronic version. Yeah, any, any yeah. version. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So most, but not all. Because we will be reading text later on, and you can follow along as we read. All right, I think we may as well begin. Okay. Our topic for tonight is the second chapter of the book, What About Prayer? But before I get to that, I want to go over the main idea of the first chapter uh, so that uh, you'll understand why it is that, uh, that the second chapter is written the way that it is. That uh, it's, not, uh, it's not enough to simply say we pray because we pray because God is above and so we pray to God. But if we have a concept of God, which is intelligence, my question now is, why is it that we need a concept of God that is different from the concept of God that was held by, let's say, Moses, the prophets, uh, the, the writers of the Talmud, the writers of our prayer book? Why today do we need a concept of God which is different. I won't say better, I want greater, but different from the concept of God that was held by them. And I think it's important to realize that one's concept of, what's that? That one's concept of God depends on your place in the world. In ancient times, in the times of the Bible, the world that people understood was severely delimited. It was a small area. We were, t we're talking about an area around the Mediterranean, the, the Middle East. That's what the world was in those days. In, Ju in Judea, we can, most scholars agree that if you read references to God, to Israel's concept of God in the earliest stages of the Bible, the people thought of God as the God of Israel, one of the many gods, maybe the best God, the greatest God. What was different possibly about the Jewish belief in this one God was the one God of, of Israel. There was no God of war. There was no God of the moon. There was no uh, God of agriculture. There was one God for the Jewish people, unlike the, the, uh, the uh, theocratic systems of many of the other nations at that time. It's not until rather late in biblical history, probably around the year 500 with the prophet that we call Deutero Isaiah, that we begin to get the idea of one universal God. But what does universal mean in those days? Universal means the, the part of the earth that those people knew. So let's say from the fifth pre-Christian century on, Jews believed in one God who governs the known world at that time. My contention is that that kind of a belief in God does not serve us in the days when we think of earth as being somewhat much greater than the earth that people understood in those days, that earth is part of a galaxy, part, part of the uh, of the solar system, that there are galaxies beyond our galaxies. If God is our God, if God is the God of Earth and of our uh, solar system, then God is also the God of the galaxies that are beyond us, going on and on to infinity. So that when you have a concept of infinity, when you have a concept of billions and billions of stars and solar systems, 
uh, beyond imagination, because infinity is something that's beyond our imagination, then your concept of God has to change also. So let, let me pause there to see if, if we're on the same page together. Any comments on that before we go on? I'm uh, interested in, 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 in Mine's not yes. now. Now I'm interested in you, Shlomo. We can before hear you, answering this question. I'm interested. You can hear me, right? Can you hear me? I can hear Shlomo. I think. Yeah. Okay. My I'm question not sure who before me is. answering this one is me. Go ahead. I'm interested in your description you or you using the words. Yeah, and an infinite intelligence. I'm, I want to hear a little bit more yes. about that because that's central to your concept of God, I think. And. I think it's essential that we remove all, all kinds of anthropomorphic ideas from our concept of God. That God is not a body. Uh, Ma Maimonides uh, put it, okay. that, that uh, ain't no goof, God has no body. To describe God in any human terms is wrong. Mm -hmm. that, that God is, is the concept God is something beyond our understanding in the three-dimensional world in which we exist. God is infinite. That's something that's very, very difficult, if at all possible, for the human being to, to compass, to really understand what infinity is. If God is infinite, then God is beyond any kind of earthly description. God is of an entirely different substance, a different dimension. And how does that and how can we use the word intelligent to describe so, him? How can we use what word to describe So how do we use the word intelligent? Simply because I can't think of any other word. Uh, simply because I can't think of any other word to, to join with infinite okay. that indicates the creative of, of the universe. I do believe that God is the creative power of the universe, that the universe was created according to certain natural law, the law of God, and that the only human term that I can use to describe that is intelligence. So the fault is mine and anybody and else who's trying to, to find words to describe God. The best I can come up with is intelligence. And the natural law the exists comment without before a God. We go on. I, I believe that. I think that the natural law was created in the, in the creative process of God billions and billions of years ago, an infinity of years ago, uh, that what we call now natural law is one of the indications we have. By trying to understand natural law, we try to understand the essence of God. In other words, if, if we go against something that we know as natural law, that we are going against something that God... Well, let me give you an example. In, in our period, right? Okay. Um, um, pollution. Just to pick one. Pollution. We know, there's, there is no doubt the fact that the way the human beings through factories, reasons of energy, and so on, that we are polluting the world. I believe that natural law tells us that if we continue along the process, we're going to destroy the world. I think that that's the way that God created the world. Part of the creative process has within it certain laws, and we have to come to understand those laws. If we don't understand them, then we go on with something like polluting destroying climate change, all of these things, which we know from scientists today are leading to destruction. That's the natural law which God created. 
We have to live with it and understand it. I'm Maslin. Okay. Can I speak? Can you yes, go ahead. Yeah. Each time you say God created, I get a very anthropomorphic feeling. There's, you're almost creating a duality. There is the God that created the laws, and then there are the laws. Can't we just shortcut this by saying the laws are God? When we say God created, we it have limitations. Yeah. The reason I use that term, God created, is because our language has limitations. We don't have a language that, that has in it the concept of infinity. When I say God created, I don't know how God created. I don't know what the creative process was. All I know is that I don't believe that this universe this infinite universe could have come into existence without an, a master intelligence behind it that set it into motion. And so that's my God belief. I have to use human language though, and human language is anthropomorphic. All right, I wanna to proceed to something else. Uh, if I were to ask you, of all of the prayers that we uh, use in all synagogues, Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, in all synagogues, on the high holidays, which prayer would you say is the most sacred? Anybody can answer. Think about your own experiences uh -huh. in the synagogue on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Somebody spoke up. I said the Shema. The Shema. Well, the Shema is something that we recite daily, every day. Uh, the Shema is the, what we call the watchword of the Jewish people. Uh, it's a quotation <coughs> from the Torah. It's not an originally conceived prayer by a human being. I, what I'm, yes, you could say that the Shema, which we recite daily, Shabbat, holidays, and everything, is, is the central prayer, what we call the watchword of our people. It's the central, the core prayer of our prayer book. But it's not what I would call the most sacred, the most awesome of all the prayers of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Any other ideas? This is Arlene. I'm I always this think question. of the Unitana. I, go, go this ahead. is Arlene. I, I think I think the Unitana yeah. Toka is the one that I think of as being the most central of the Rosh Hashanah of the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur prayers. All right. Any other opinions? I think it's um, Adonai Adonai El Rachun Vechanun Erech Apayim Barav Chesed V'Yamet. Well, that's a prayer that we recite not only in Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, but on all of the holidays, the uh, uh, Adonai El Rachun. Uh, but I'm thinking specifically of the high holidays. And Shlomo, did you have something to say? No, I saw your light go on. But I'm going to agree with Arlene that the Untana Toka prayer is the most sacred prayer of the High Holy Days. I thought that somebody would say something like, like uh, Kol Nidre, but uh, if, if you know the history of Kol Nidre, you know that Kol Nidre is not a prayer, that Kol Nidre is a legal formula that you recite before the beginning of Yom Kippur. It's not really a prayer, it's something to clear, to clear conscience before you enter into the holiest of days, because you can't enter into the holiest of days with, with, a, uh, with a sullied uh, conscience. So not only is uh, Kol Nidre not the prayer that, that I would consider to be the most holy, but it's not even recited on Yom Kippur, it's the prelude to Yom Kippur. But getting back to Arlene's answer, the Untana Toka, would you like to go any further with that, Arlene? Why? 
I, I guess I, it, it strikes me that it's the one that most focuses the concepts of what our intention, our kavana should be with respect to um, our overall approach to the, to, to, the, to, to the 10 days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur of a kind of self-evaluation, um, s- reflection on where we've been and then kind of um, using is that as, an, as a um, mechanism for determining what's going to happen in the year ahead. So the, the Untana Tokov sort of characterizes what it is that we're there on Yom Kippur for, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur for. Yeah. Begging God for a good life, who shall live, who shall die. All right, what I'd like to do now, uh, I, I want to read the translation of Unatana Toko, just considering what we've already said about anthropomorphism and how to reject anthropomorphism. I want to read the, the translation. Rabbi, there's some problems with, there are problems with your microphone or you need to stay closer to it because your sound is not, is not good. Sound is not good. Can, can you hear me now? That's better. Yes, that's, that's much better. better. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll try to be closer. All right, I'm, I'm going to read now the translation of Unitane Tokev. Let us declare the holy pro- power of this day, for it is awesome and mighty. Your sovereignty is exalted upon it, and you faithfully take your place upon your throne established in love, born on the covenant born of the covenant between you and ourselves. You are the true judge and witness. You write and seal and inscribe and take account. You remember all that we have forgotten, opening the book of remembrance from which everything is read and in which is the seal of every human being. The great shofar is sounded and a still small voice is heard. The angels in heaven are dismayed and are seized with fear and trembling as they proclaim, Behold the day of judgment. The hosts of heaven are to be arraigned in judgment, for in your eyes even they are not free from guilt. All who live in the world pass today before you, one by one, like a flock of sheep, as a shepherd gathers the sheep and causes them to pass beneath the staff. So you pass and record, count and visit, every living soul, appointing the measure of every creature's life and decreeing its destiny. And then it goes on. Rosh Hashanah, it is written, and in Yom Kippur, it is decided. And then goes on with who shall live, who shall die, who by this and who by that. Why do you think I decided to devote that bit of time, that segment, to the reading of Unita Tokev, introducing the, the, the question of what about prayer in the, with the concept of the infinite intelligent God, the infinity of God, the non-anthropomorphism of God for us, why would I have read that? What what is there about the Unitane Tokef that is uh, germane to what we're talking about now? Um, Shem, I'm going to um, uh, stop you for just a second. You've inadvertently turned off your video. There you go. Now you're back. Yeah, I'm, I'm back there. Okay. Okay, so the question, it, it, can, can we, rational people in the 21st century, with, a, with an idea of a non-anthropomorphic God, can we, in all honesty, say a prayer like Unetane Tokev?
Anybody? Well, it's, it's obviously all in the interpretation of it. <laughs> yes. All right, how do you interpret it? Well, the concepts were from a different era, but now we're, we're putting our modern sensibilities to it. We're reframing all of these concepts to make it work for us and have meaning. Yes. My question, should, should we continue knowing what we know, having a theology like we have, should we continue to be praying a prayer like Unatana Toka? Well, no one's given a better prayer. And it's Nobody's the, come up with anything better. <laughs> that's right. And what I'm saying is that it's, um, it's, my brother would like this one. It's the only prayer I think in Judaism where we have an, a, an internal accounting of ourselves. I mean, every week, we, every day, every week, we pray for you know, good health and uh, you know, good life. But it's the only time of the year for the three days uh, you know, where we, just, just, we prepare the list. And did, uh, was I good? Was I, you know, did you, could I do things better? Make improvements? So, and, and, so as I said, it's like an inter, inter, internal accounting. I mean, right. some of the ideas may be outmoded, but you know, maybe some will come, one of these years, one of the uh, groups will come with, with a more contemporary um, version of the list. Let, let me admit at this point, that Unatana Tokov, I think, is an absolutely beautiful prayer. I love it. And wh when I get to that point of the service, I, I see uh, my father, the chazan, uh, in, in the white, white robe and the tall white cap, uh, singing Unatana Tokov with the entire congregation crying. Uh, it, it's a very poignant moment uh, to me, Unatana Tokov, even though it's full of anthropomorphic ideas. I'm um, just think of it. God with a staff and we are little sheep and we pass onto the staff so that we can be judged uh, by God. Uh, all of the anthropomorphism that's in that prayer. Now, as we go on today, as I'm going to be getting into the chapter on, uh, on prayer, you're going to discover that there are certain prayers that I wish were not in the prayer that I think we could uh, easily just dismiss, get out of our liturgy, because I think they confuse. But Unitana Tokev, with all of its anthropomorphism, I think if we, if we get to the basic, the, the basic concept of Unitana Tokev, which is that we are judged. Now, don't think of it in an anthropomorphic way that God is looking down from that throne. You remember it starts by saying that God is on a throne. Uh, it's it's not it doesn't matter what the what the uh, theatrics of it are the idea is that this is a day when we are going to be judged who is going to judge us we are going to judge us by the way i see that my picture has disappeared again uh, oh here we go start video again okay i'm i'm back any other thoughts on unitana toka before i go to our text well, I struggle with it every year um, because of that very issue that I'm trying to hold in my brain the thought of this infinite intelligence, but I'm reading words that are talking about something very um, physical and anthropomorphic. So I try to look at it as a poetic metaphor. It's, it's language from previous times but we're now, I have a, maybe I have a different understanding. I, this is my understanding, I agree with you. My understanding is much more abstract. So I'm constantly having to read those words, but then hold in my brain, okay, but it really does, I'm not really praying to a man with a beard on a throne. I'm trying to um, assess myself. So yeah, I agree with you that it's, it's the, the, the personal assessment that's the issue, that's the key thing. Look, it's it's poetry. <coughs> it's it's not uh, prose. It's poetry. Poetry has images. The image of God sitting on a throne doesn't mean that God is sitting on a throne. The idea is that God is exalted. That God is is um, 
is it pervades the universe that that God is omnipresent. Uh, the the, yeah. the various items yeah. that are in that prayer that are anthropomorphic think of as poetry, but the basic idea of the prayer that we have come to the day of the year when we have to make when we have to make an accounting of our lives, of our souls. And I think the poetry of Unatana Toka is just magnificent and draws us into that ability to face ourselves. But there's also a component of it, I think, if I'm thinking of the right thing, which is instructive. Utfila, utsudaka, utashuva, mavirin, et roa, hagzera. A magnificent statement. That kind of tells us. Go, I'm sorry, I interrupted you. What were you saying? Well, I was just saying, and that instructs us. I mean, if we're going to be looking at ourselves and judging ourselves and assessing, the prayer is also telling us, or the poetry is, actually, is also telling us, this is what you have to do to make things better. And, and, and I that think statement the itself, that statement at the conclusion of Unutanda Toka summarizes the whole thing absolutely magnificently. The Shuvat, Filat, Sadaka, how, what more exalted teaching could we come out of Yom Kippur with than the idea is that we have to devote ourselves in the year to come to Tefillah, Sadaka, and, and, uh, and, and uh, to Shuva, that with, without these things, the whole exercise of Yom Kippur is meaningless. All right, what I'd like to do now is to get into our text, the text of the chapter on prayer. If you'd like to follow along in the, in the uh, oh, oops, I just lost. How did I do that? Can you hear me? Yes, I just we can lost hear you. the whole thing. Yeah, we can hear. But I, 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 I have a blank screen that says Zoom. I don't know how that happened. <coughs> I've lost the picture. <coughs> do you do you have a uh, we, we can see and hear you. Yeah, do you, do you have uh, uh, something identified as Zoom across the bottom of your screen that you can click on? No. Uh, tiny on the bottom. Uh, yes. Ah, uh, uh. Okay, we're back. All right, technology. <laughs> Now, proceeding from the, the last week's chapter, if God is not imminent, not looking down at us and waiting to hear what we want, what we might even legitimately need, then the obvious question is why pray? Listen to the plain description of Sonnet. You have to face your microphone. Not to pray to God. With this in Tehillim, chapter 83. O oh God, do not keep silent. Do not hold your peace and be still, O oh God. Well, the searching words of a 20th century Christian theologian, I have always found prayer difficult. So often it feels like a fruitless game of hide and seek, where we seek and God hides. How does the concept of a silent God, unmoved by prayer, differ from the atheist contention there's no God. Dimitri, in the Brothers Karamazov, famously declares, if God does not exist, then everything is permitted. We might take the cue from Dostoevsky and declare, if God does not respond, then everything is permitted. Why should I live in accordance with what I've been taught is a righteous life if God does not protect me from harm? <clears throat> Why should I pray for healing if God does not cure? Why should I care about the hungry, the homeless, and the oppressed if God does nothing about them? If God does not act in our world, 
And isn't all of our believing and praying absurd? We are glibly assured that there are no atheists in foxholes. An aviator during World War I told of how he had flown over the front line of the French and German trenches on a Sunday morning and seeing groups of soldiers on both sides praying. Shim, you're going to have believers Shim, on one Shim, side. I'm sorry, you have to face the, the, yeah. the screen. It's hard, very hard to hear you. Well, this is uh, difficult to face the screen and, and read. <laughs> okay. Uh, the soldiers on both sides were praying for victory over the God believers who were on the other side, praying just as earnestly for victory on the other side. Surely God must be with us because our cause is just. And of course, the same misguided faith on the other side. And what are those millions whose faith is so strong that they reject medical wisdom and rely on prayer? What are those other Christians who believe that performing the prescribed rituals with regularity and piety will endear them to God while giving nearly a thought to the system of ethics that was meant to be emulated by those rituals? A scandalous example of that last Neo religious, just a few years ago, a pious Jew, scrupulous of every jot and tittle of the world, was convicted of fraud, and, of fraud and exploitation of labor in his kosher meatpacking facility. He was punctilious about his daily prayers and the kashrut of the meat that he sold, but not at all about the basic human needs of his employees. You might uh, remember that case. Uh, Man's name was Rubashkin, a rabbi, a Hasidic rabbi. A Hasidic sage once taught that those who pray for their bread will surely go hungry. By no means was that pious sage rejecting the efficacy of prayer. What he was rejecting was the simple minded belief that in and of itself will influence God to fulfill the desires of the person praying. Our search for an adult concept of God must not be confused by those masses of conventionally re religious persons and their priests, ministers, gurus, ayatollahs, and rabbis who believe in that their God is waiting to be told needs to be done by those who recite formulaic prayers with faith. So return to our question, why pray? Why pray to a God who certainly does not need our prayers who will not circumvent nature with miracles, and who, according to the verse after verse in the Bible, has charged us with the responsibility for righting the wrongs and curing the ill that I'd be praying about. Why does a person who believes that God is transcendent and imperfect to the will to the whims of human beings pray? And now a, a few reasons. Are you able to hear me all right? Any problems hearing me? Okay, I'll continue. The reasons why we pray, from my point of view, these are the reasons that I think that a person living today, a rational person who believes in a non-anthropomorphic God, why we pray. We pray in order to connect with our sacred tradition, to read and speak and sing the words of ancestors who felt the presence of God and who articulated the will of God as they understood it in their generation. We pray so that we may reverently and humbly approach an understanding of what the purpose of our God-given lives, to help us, as Einstein put it, draw God's lines after him. Keep losing that picture. We pray so that we may understand our finitude and yet be inspired to recognize that finitude as an essential element of the infinite. We pray so that we might quicken that bit of divinity that lies so often dormant within us. We pray in the midst of a community of praying neighbors so that we may feel a kinship with people who, as we, are seeking. We grind strength from them and in turn, we strengthen them. 
We pray so that we may be reminded that God created us to perfect the world as co-creative partners. Finally, we pray so that we may be reminded to emulate the holiness of God in our daily lives, ever sensitive to the needs of God's children. Such prayer is not intended to influence God. Rather, it is intended to make us better women and men. But can one truly renew and speak to a God who is infinite and immutable? Are there such things as mystical moments for men and women who do not conceive of God as a providential presence? Yes. Oh, yes. I felt the presence of God, and I spoke to God when my wife gave birth to each of our children. I felt God's hand on mine when in a Muslim mortuary, I closed my father's eyes. I repeated the words of the patriarch Jacob, surely God is in this place, when I sat among thousands in Jerusalem, listening to Leontine Price with the floodlit Tower of David behind her, singing, he's got the whole world in his hands. When I walked through through the woods one crisp sunny autumn day, seeking answers to unanswerable questions. When I sat on the hospital bed of a revered and beloved teacher, holding his hand in his final hour. When I stood before the ark on Yom Kippur and joined the cantor in singing Avinu Malkeinu. When standing among a group of rabbis, I cried through the Kaddish on a wintry day in an Auschwitz crematorium. Yes, I felt the presence of my beloved yet unknowable God at each of those times and in each of those places. Those who pray to God in order to conjole God to do their bidding are like children writing letters to Santa Claus. It's cute, but it's as far from mature faith as a child's ditty is from Bach's B minor mass. Real prayer, adult prayer, acknowledges the majesty of God and the responsibility which that places upon us. The liturgy Chaim Stern interpolated into one of the most ancient and well-known prayers in Jewish liturgy, just this idea of our human responsibility to act in the name of God. The traditional words are italicized. Stern's extension of those words are in Roman. So you're all familiar with these Atagi borli olam Adonai, which means your God is everlasting. What do we add to that? Help us to use our might for good and not for evil. It goes on. You are the source of life and blessing. Help us to choose life for ourselves and our children. You are the support of the falling. Help us to lift up the fallen. You are the author of freedom. Help us to set free the captive. You are our hope in death as in life. Help us to keep faith with those who sleep in the dust. Prayer then moves us to act as we might want God to act. Returning to the words of the, the Christian theologian, with apologies for his male language, he wrote, yet I cannot leave prayer alone for long. My knee drives me to, a, to him, and I have a feeling that he has his own reasons for hiding himself, and that finally all of my seeking will prove infinitely worthwhile, and I'm not sure what I mean by finding. Some days my very seeking seems to be a kind of finding. And of course, if finding means the end of seeking, it were better to go on seeking. All of our seeking in the synagogue, in the church, in the mosque, in the woods, in the hospital chapel, in the concert hall, on the heights or in the abyss, all of our seeking will prove infinitely worthwhile if we finally understand that as we pray, God is entering our heart. As we pray, we take a small step 
toward understanding what God wants from us. Let me pause there to ask for any comments or questions about what I've just read. You describe a variety of situations. One was uh, being with a group of rabbis and uh, one was listening to a chazan, I think it might have been your father, and having a certain emotional experience while you were doing that. And you label that experience, I think, and I need, I need you to set me straight here. It sounds to me like you're calling that experience God or experiencing the presence of God. Do I understand that correctly? Uh, pretty close. What I'm, what I'm saying is that these are mystical moments. These are moments that go beyond themselves, that it doesn't just happen, that something can happen to your heart, to your soul, that makes you believe more strongly possibly than you have ever believed before that God is, that God pervades the universe, that this is a moment of contact between God and the human being. Okay, thank you for that. I have a better understanding of what you what you mean by that. Any other comments? All right, then I'm going to proceed. <clears throat> Having said all of that, but, and this is a very big but, while many of the prayers in Jewish prayer books are beautiful and might move us to act beneficently in God's there are others that put the exercise of communal prayer in this question. And I'm beginning with one of my pet peeves about the prayer book as it is used in uh, traditional synagogues today. Some of you might uh, have noticed, uh, I'm sure Robin has noticed that uh, when it comes time at BZBI for the Musaf prayer, Robin, what do I usually do? Robin? Go oh, home. He leaves. Right. <laughs> he leaves. Right. I usually leave when, when the time comes for uh, the, the Musaf prayer. Uh, let me try to explain why I do that. I, I'm not trying to make any kind of a statement. I'm just trying, for me, the exalted feeling that I have during a prayer service, especially the singing parts of the service, and I love, I love to sit in shul and I love to sing along with the congregation. The more that the congregation participates, the more that I like it. But when you come to say something like Musaf, that feeling leaves me entirely. Now, what? The Musaf, as you know, is added to the morning service of uh, Shabbat and Shatul. And it glorifies... Can't hear you. Rabbi, Rabbi, you left your you left your mic behind. Oh. If you no, would repeat uh, what you just said, it was kind of it was lost. Okay. Uh, the the Musaf prayer, the purpose of the Musaf prayer is to remind us of the sacrificial system that existed in the temple in the days of the Bible. Now, uh, if, if you follow the text in the Orthodox prayer book, this is the text. Kikanta Shabbat, you instituted the Sabbath and desired its sacrifices. May it be your will, Adonai our God and God of our fathers, to lead us in joy to our land where we will prepare for you the sacrifices that are obligatory for us, the daily sacrifices and the additional sacrifices of this Sabbath day. The Musaf service for festivals actually quotes those passages from the Torah that specify which sacrifices are to be offered on the various occasions. For example, on Pesach, we read, you shall sacrifice an offering made by fire, a burnt offering to Adonai, two young bullocks, and one ram, and seven he lambs of the first year. Occasionally, I find myself on the Sabbath in a synagogue where it is a Musaf service, and as the congregation recites these words, I can only wonder if the worshipers understand what they are saying. Can any civilized person pray for the reestablishment of a temple with animal sacrifices? 
Now, I, I uh, will concede that the conservative prayer book uh, puts all of this in a historical setting. The Orthodox prayer, prayer book actually prays for us to reestablish the sacrificial cult. The conservative prayer says, uh, this is what we used to do. But my question is, and, and I'll open it here, do any of you have the same reaction to that prayer? Uh, what I'm saying is, how can you take prayer seriously if you're praying for something which is repugnant, which is horrible, which you certainly don't want? How can you pray for it? I don't walk out of shul during Musaf, but I do look at other parts of the Siddur. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking in Shacharit and Pesukei de Simra, and, but I have the same feeling and reaction to Musaf. And I understand it is what I'm reading when I, it's when I read it. It's reconstructionist. They feel I, I used to belong to a show, well, in a reconstructionist show, where there is no Musaf, and instead there's a congregational discussion of the parasha of the Shavuot. I was just going to describe something just like that at a Germantown Center. Uh, you know, they have several minyanim that meet uh, during the regular service at Germantown. Right after I retired, the Germantown Center was the closest place where there was a Chavura, so I used to go there to the reconstructionist Chavura. And what they would do when the time came for Musaf, they would say, if anybody would like to say the Musaf, go stand over there in the corner. We're going to have a discussion now. And the, we, we had the most wonderful discussions during the uh, 15 or 20 minutes that, uh, the, uh, that uh, maybe one or two of the members of the Chavara were standing in the corner reciting the Musa. So what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that if you have things in your prayer book, things that are um, obviously approved of, ordained by the synagogue in which you're praying, yes, you then uh, yeah. doesn't that, doesn't that sort of cast a, a shadow over the whole praying enterprise. Comments? I'm surprised that Mort doesn't comment. Well, sorry, Nada, I didn't hear what you said. Nada, go on. I'm uh, just, just saying that you probably know our son. He's a member of that uh, minion. Well, it, it's, been a, it's been quite a few years since I was there. After we moved into town, I started coming to BZBI. But how many uh, years are you? How many years are you in town? Uh, how many years are we in town? About twenty. Well, he was there. No, about fifty. About fifteen. Yeah. yeah, he's been he's been there a long time. David, right. David, can we, back, can we get back to the text? Anyway, um, yeah. I, you know, only recently I more? paid more attention. Yeah to the extra paragraph that the Sim Shalom has, where it, uh, it, it you know, the little note in front of it says, you, can, you may want to choose this paragraph, which makes no mention of the uh, sacrificial system. Right. Uh, I that, around yes, with, I right, saw that. Some of our, and I came around yeah. with some, some of our friends who go to Orthodox schools, um, who have a way of, uh, perhaps like uh, some other people in other shows like me, uh, who happen to uh, not show up for Shachri, but come for Musaf, or come for Torah reading in Musaf. And, and I say, gee, it seems like you want uh, to rather have uh, animal sacrifices than to praise and, and worship the Sabbath. Right. It, 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 if the recitation of Musaf is ordained by the synagogue in which you are praying, then to me that casts a pall over the entire service. Why would, why would a rabbi and a congregation read these prayers that they disagree with, that they find repugnant, in the same prayer book in which there are such gorgeous poetic tributes to God? and to the Jewish people, and to what our purpose is in life. Doesn't that just, just spoil things? Comments? Nada, your, your mic is open. I'll, I'll close it. All right. 
All right, then I'm going to proceed. There are two different. Well, Shane, what's Shane that? Is more. Um, what is that? I, it's more. Yeah. Uh, I, I also find, in addition to what you're saying here, in terms of people reading the words, but it's also um, the Chazonim who put in such, um, you know, how should I say, such powerful music into Musaf. Again, in a way that there are times when I think the, the melodies don't even match anything near what the text is trying to say. Uh, I, I think you're right that uh, the, um, the, the Musaf service is sort of the happy hunting ground for Chazanam. It, it has, um, I'm, I'm thinking of songs that we sing. Uviyom uh, HaShabbat uh, Shnei Kvasim B'nei Shana Tamimim Olat Shabbat B'Shabbato Al Olat HaTamid V'Nizkat uh, and we sing that. Uh, we, we, we sing this beautiful little Hasidic melody describing the animals that we are going to take and sacrifice. That's Musa. And yes, Chazanam used to make, make their livings out of uh, some of the things that are in the Musaf service. Right. Yeah, that's the Amidah, but there's also the Ein Kelohenu and the Aleinu. I, don't, I wouldn't want to leave out the Aleinu. Oh, no, not, and not at all. Alone. And that's not, Musaf is the, is the uh, Amida. Yeah. The essence of the Musaf is the Amida prayer, not the Ein Kelohenu and the Aleinu and everything that's I understand followed. that. Yeah. No, I, w I wouldn't want to lose those at all. Right. And I, I regret that when I do leave the synagogue, uh, during the uh, reading of Musaf, that I have to miss uh, singing Eint Eloheinu and Alein L'Shaberch and so on. Uh, sometimes if they announce that there's going to be a super special Kiddush, I do stay through. <laughs> okay. Yes, food, food trumps everything, doesn't it? Right, um, absolutely. <laughs> it's Robin. Do you think that these melodies just um, were instituted in a way to both elevate that part of the service and they seem so some of them so jolly um in addition to being you know high chazanut they're also kind of pretty as you said in comparison to what they're actually describing do you think that they ever were developed in a way to um i don't know mask what it was what the text was uh possibly uh, I, I don't think that when they were singing these songs, they were actually thinking of the text at all. These were simply the words that fit into the melody, mm -hmm. and uh, these were the traditional words. And I, I think what, what is very often the case is that we recite or sing certain prayers without giving a thought to what they actually say. They all, these particular prayers, especially some of the best songs, come at the end of the service and it's one of the right. ways it's one of the ways to keep people hanging around to the end because it's yeah. getting close to lunchtime by that time uh, i would think that one of the reasons why the chazonim uh, uh focused on musaf is the congregation especially at bzbi comes in by dribs and drabs through the whole shop it's not how did you get into the mentory the entire congregation is actually there I, 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 I must admit, quite distressing. Uh, if, if you know uh, my, my synagogue habit, I'm usually there before we start uh, because I think that a person should be there right from the beginning of the service and also because I'm not going to be there for Musaf. I like the, the, the Shacharit uh, very much. Uh, but um, uh, I think when I first came to BZBI, the service began at 9, if I'm not mistaken, and they moved it to 9.30 in the hopes that people would be there at 9.30, but people are not there, and those of you who come at a decent hour know that it's not until you get beyond 10 o'clock that you have a decent size uh, kahal. Yeah. And uh, you know, one of the reasons for that also is because the service is quite long, but I don't want to start criticizing uh, <laughs> at this point. Uh, the, the service is quite long, 
and uh, people are, you know, want to come for an hour of Shabbat uh, worship and not for two and a half hours. And then we, we come to the whole problem of the, uh, of the Torah reading, which is, which I will not bring up at this point because it has a lot of Thank uh, you. Uh, sensitivity. Thank you. Thank you. Please don't. Please don't. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I won't. I won't. All right. Continuing. Uh, one of the other things that I do not like in the uh, in the uh, service, and, and with this, I'm sure some of you will disagree with me. There are traditional prayers that refer to God as Mechaye Meitim. Lost you again. We lost you again. You turned you turned again. your head away from the mic. Okay, I will try to be closer. There are traditional prayers that refer to God as Mechaye Meitim, the one who resurrects the dead. And then there is the twice daily recitation right after Shema of the paragraph from Deuteronomy 11 that promises God's blessing and seasonal rains on all who observe the commandment and the anger of Adonai and divine punishment for all who stray for God. Some of this can be excused as metaphoric language, but why should any Jewish prayer book today subject the sincere worshiper to a primitive and long rejected theology? So how about Mechaye HaMetim, that God gives life to the dead, that God resurrects the dead? I substitute Mechaye Kochai whenever I come to that. Exactly what I do. Mechaye HaKol is what I say. But the prayer book and the rabbi and the cantor are reciting Mechaye HaMetim. Leave that. Is it? Is a way that you can, you can somehow justify that phrase today. Any comment? Okay, then I'll proceed. Having pointed out some of the failings of the Siddur, the traditional prayer book that might alienate a rational Jew who has uh, a rational Jew who has come to the synagogue to pray along with his or her community, let's look at a few examples of the opposite, passages in the Siddur that can move the worshiper just a bit closer to God. Three of my favorite prayers may be found in the traditional daily morning service the Shachari. Believe it or not, the Siddur actually has a prayer thanking God for the proper functioning of the digestive system. An excerpt. Praise to God who created the human being with wisdom, including in that creation a multitude of passages and orifices. It is understood that if any one of them should be opened or one of them closed, it would be impossible to exist and stand before you. Are you familiar with that prayer? No? It's, it's right there in the Birkota Shachar, where we thank God for the orifices in our body functioning. Chilulim, chilulim. Chilulim, chilulim, yep. It ends with Rufei Kol Basaro Maflila that God heals all flesh and it does wondrous. So, you know, not, not to be uh, too earthy about it. What we're thankful for is the ability to sit on the and do what we have to. Now, if, that, if there's an earthiness about that, there is a, a, hum, a humanity about that that I, see is, is that I think is absolutely gorgeous, that it should be in a prayer book. That, that we, we are prescribed to thank God for the functioning of our human body. Things that, that uh, uh, you know, polite people would prefer not to say. Uh, they, they would gloss over it as sort of a, give an embarrassed tee and, and uh, you know, not refer to such things. But our prayer book is earthy. It's, it's real. It speaks to us. And uh, I, I find that one of my favorite prayers. Go on, another one. Adonai, our God, may the words of your Torah 
protection to our mouths and to the mouths of all Israel, so that we and our children and all the children of our people may become familiar with you and students of your Torah. What must it have done to the east of the Jewish people over the centuries to begin each day prayer for learning? Now, I would say that generation after generation of our people praying to God, thanking God for the ability to study, to learn, has had a profound impact on the Jewish people. What we've been able to contribute to the world. I find that particularly And this is a quotation from an early Hellenic teaching. There are activities the rewards for which are beyond men. Honoring Father and Mother. We, we, we can't yes? understand you. You need to fix your microphone. Uh, I, I really don't know what I can do at this point. I'll try to be closer now, to you. Now we hear you, but when, when you're reading, we can't. Okay, um, this is the prayer. These are activities, the reward for which is beyond measure, honoring father and mother, deeds of loving kindness, regular attendance of the hospital, this is the sick, dowering needy brides, assisting in the burial of the dead, devoted prayer, and make peace between and the study of Torah is equal to them all. Talmud Torah can neged kulam. So these are three prayers that are in our morning service that I find particularly beautiful, particularly moving, that have had a profound would any of you like to offer a prayer that you find to be a particular favorite from the Siddur? I will. Go ahead. I like the Modet Ani. And I like the Modet Ani because I think it's incredible that the first word that a Jew should say, should say every morning is, I am thankful. The second thing that I love about it is the last two words, Rabba Emunatecha, which is talking to God and saying, great is your faith. We're not talking about our faith here. Great is your faith. And I look at that. I thank you for bringing me, you know, for returning my soul to me, giving me a new day. And it's such an act of faith on your part to give me a new day. And what's the faith that you have? That I'm going to make this a day worth living. How? By doing godly acts. And I just love the way, I love the, the Modet part of it, and I love the fact that it calls on me to make it a day worth living. Thank you very much. Very good. I agree with you. Modet Ani is another of my okay. favorite prayers. I like the opening prayer of Mariv. What is that? The opening prayer of Mariv. Uh, Mariv the prayer of the Mariv, uh, Mariv, Mariv, Mariv Yeah. Because it, it's the only prayer I think in the whole Siddur that's Actually, extra terrestrial. It's the only prayer that's about the whole universe, not just about us or Earth. Actually, I have that down here. I, I say I could go on to quote a dozen more prayers from the Siddur, but I believe yeah. we must close it with understanding the God <laughs> designed for humanity. But I'll content myself yeah. with just one more, and that's the one that you just quoted. Please. It goes on, you have loved your people Israel with an everlasting love. You, brought, you taught us Torah and commandments, yeah. laws and statutes. Therefore, Adonai, our God, when we lie down and when we rise up, now we, we will meditate on your laws and we will rejoice in your word, yeah. the words of your Torah and your commandments forever. For they are our life and the length of our days. May you never take away your love for us. A beautiful, I, beautiful prayer. Well, the paragraph before I go, that's my favorite. The paragraph before, Hamari Bar Ravin, not only Hamari Israel. That's right. where I, I see it. It's so, so magnificent. Beautiful. Yeah. Anybody yeah, else a favorite prayer? 
Well, continuing with Ma'ariv, I think for decades, uh, the Hashki Venu has always been my favorite. I've never wavered from that. And obviously, Fro Salenu Sukkot Shlomech. Again, a very, very beautiful prayer, the Hashki Venu. The Adi Hashki Venu Adonai Eloheinu L'Shalom. Spread over us the tabernacle of your peace. What a gorgeous prayer. Okay. Anybody else? Um, the prayer, uh, Adon Olam, uh, when I read it in English, um, the meaning uh, to me is very beautiful. You know, God is with you while you uh, arise and when you're asleep and always be with you. I think it's a beautiful prayer. The, Ado the uh, Adon Olam. Mm -hmm. Anybody else, a favorite prayer that you'd like to share with us? I like all the prayers that are about um, the... Uh, uh, all of creation praising God, and we're joining in to that. So Psalm 148 and Nishvat Kol Chai are among those. The Nishmat Kol Chai prayer that Howard has just referred to is an absolutely beautiful prayer. And there's a part in, in the middle of it uh, which describes uh, the... the um, uh, the, the way that uh, that God has create has um, created the world uh, in in um, uh, I'm trying to think of the words right now they're uh, they're escaping me right but in the, in the central section of the Nishmat Kol uh, Chai there there's a beautiful description of uh, of uh, of the the way that God um, um, corresponds with us the way that God attaches Himself to us. Any other favorite prayer? I like the one that is not uh, usually said, uh, Anim's Me Wrote. I think it says beautiful poetry. It's, uh, uh, you know, similar, uh, I can't think of the word, but uh, it's what poetry is. It's poetic, it's not yeah. precise, the same thing. Uh, there's a word there mm -hmm. that I'm missing. You know, the Anim's Me Wrote is, is very nice. Uh, it's um, many synagogues simply discard it because it, it comes traditionally at the end of the service and people are very anxious to get to the Kiddush and it would take <laughs> some more time <laughs> to sing the Animus Mirat. But one of the reasons why the Animus Mirat is so nice is because it has a nice melody. It's lovely. And another of those melodies from a prayer that would otherwise be uh, obscure uh, when we're taking out the Torah. It's such a lovely melody, beautiful melody. I referred at the beginning of our session tonight, I referred to the, uh, the Kol Nidre and how it's really not a prayer at all. Kol Nidre has one of the most magnificent melodies that has ever been conceived by human beings. It's a gorgeous melody. And if it weren't for that melody, I don't think we'd be reciting the Kol Nidre at all in our synagogues. But who could ever have a Yom Kippur service without Kol Nidre because of that melody? You mentioned taking the Torah out of the Ark with Be'an Arachetz. Yeah. What I find, what I like about Ein Kamocha is Malchutcha Malchut Kol Olamim. Your kingdom is all of the worlds. Umem Shaltacha Bechol Dor Vador. But where you rule is dependent on every generation. And I again look at that as our responsibility to make Malchut Adonai Memshelet Adonai. Uh huh. Good. Any other favorites? We've lost me again. Right, we got me back here. Here we go. It's a very fickle uh, computer. All right, I'm going to conclude with, with these uh, paragraphs. There is no substitute 
for heartfelt personal prayer. Prayer that may be inspired by events in our daily lives or moments of crisis. But one becomes accustomed to the exercise of prayer through familiarity with the traditional prayers of the Siddur. They provide us with the vocabulary and the inspiration to approach the unapproachable. Let me re repeat that. The inspiration to approach the unapproachable. We utter these prayers not to influence God, but to influence ourselves to act as we believe God would want his creatures to act. And I'm going to conclude with a statement by Abraham Heschel. Prayer cannot mend a broken bridge or rebuild a ruined city or bring water to parched fields, but prayer can mend a broken heart, lift up a discouraged soul, and strengthen a weakened will. So that, from my point of view, is the purpose of prayer. Not to influence God, but to try to connect ourselves with God and what it is that God wants of us, what we are supposed to do to become co-creative partners with God in this world. Any other comments before we conclude? Uh, I have a question, Rabbi. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, getting back to my holidays, you sort of break your screen up. Um, I'm thinking when, when we start the Shachrit service on, on the Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, you know, we start the line with Hamelach Yoshe. It's, you know, with Right. Now, that already gives everyone the image who, who's there at the right time that, you know, the God sits on that throne up there. Even though it's, is it, so should we take it as, is it taken as poetically or is it just taken as the image of God sitting up there, you know, making, ready, getting ready with the books? That's poetry. That's poetry. poetry. Okay. And certainly we don't believe that God is sitting. Okay. Firstly, right, right. does does God sit? Does God stand? Nobody does God, knows. You know, if, if God is, if we can de-anthropomorphize God, yeah. then we can't use these human concepts of a, a, God is sitting there on the on the throne of mercy. What it means is that we are trying to connect ourselves to the merciful impulse of God, and hope that by connecting ourselves to the idea that this infinite God wants us to be merciful. Mm -hmm. Could they have written a better line to open it up instead of that line? Could What's the author, that? Could the author, author of the writers of the Sutur written a better line than that? I, 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 didn't, I didn't understand. Could, okay, could the writers of the, the editors of the Sutur, when they wrote this line, could they have written a better line because instead of saying a Melchior shave, written something else about God? Well, it's the same idea as in the Unatanatokov, also yeah. that God is sitting there on the throne of justice. Right. This is one of the very common images used in the prayer book uh, to, to characterize God, that we think of God as sitting up there on the throne of judgment. What it means to get away from the poetry is that this is a time when we're supposed to decide how we live our lives in accordance with what we believe that God wants of us. Mm -hmm. Well, I thank you all for your attention. We've reached the conclusion. I, thank you. You're very, very welcome. And I look forward to seeing you all in good health next week. Yes. Absolutely. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Okay, good night. Bye, Good to bye, see everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye. Good job. Hey, my brother. Okay. Take care, Elkin. Hi, Ira. Hi. <laughs>